Okay, an introduction to commodity trading. All right, first of all, I just want to um, basically give you my contact information and, and tell you what I am and, and what I do and the reason being, um, you know, hopefully, if, if you ever decide to, to trade commodities, um, you'll look us up. We have a lot of free educational information on our website, and it's really important that people understand what they're getting into before they actually put their money on the line. I mean, um, obviously, trading of any type, whether it's stocks or baseball cards or bubble gum, there's going to be some risk involved. But in commodities, there's a lot of leverage, and with leverage comes a substantial amount of risk, and we're going to talk about that as well. But I just want you to, you know, make sure that you know what you're doing, you understand uh, the mechanics, you understand the risks before you get in and hopefully we can help you with that we're actually a brokerage firm we're in Las Vegas Nevada uh, here's our contact information and there's our website and if you're on Twitter check us out on Twitter all right um, I am a commodity broker I'm a strategist and I'm a, and I'm and I'm an author uh, as Bob mentioned I do write a call. I've recently started writing a column for realmoney.com. Um, I also write a couple client newsletters, and I'm a columnist for Stocks and Commodities Magazine. And if you're interested in anything that you, you hear or we discuss in the class, um, feel free to, to check out my books. They're cheapest on Amazon. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. Amazon is, is the greatest thing that's, that's ever hit the face of the earth. Um, super cheap so if you're interested they have it on Kendall they have it in hardback and I'd appreciate uh, you know your patronage and if you have any questions or anything I'm always here to, to answer those for you and it's my job to let you know that there is a substantial amount of risk in trading futures and options again I mean this isn't necessarily investing this is this is trading you're gonna have good trades you're gonna have bad trades um, hopefully more good than bad but in the end there's definitely a substantial amount of risk and so don't ever forget it and I know this is a lot to digest but it's important that we that we put these types of things in here um, I'll be as brief as I can but the idea is trading may not be suitable for everybody past performance is not indicative of future results just because you see us put out a newsletter or a trade or or talk about something and it happens to work out doesn't mean that it always works out for us I mean um, we can, and I'm not saying us, but in general, any person that, that puts their, themselves out there as an educator or a broker or someone that supposedly is in the know, uh, the bottom line is we're all trying to do the same thing. We're all trying to beat the markets and we do all our homework and we can work as hard as, you know, as hard as we possibly can, but the bottom line is we don't have a crystal ball. In commodities, anything is possible, and I'm I'm serious about that. Anything is possible. I've seen it all. There's a few things that I want to just point out here. In commodities, there's leverage, there's leverage, and there's more leverage. Each commodity contract is a little bit different, some being more leveraged than others, but for the most part, I mean, you're probably talking about... Uh, anywhere from 100 to 1 to maybe 20 to 1 is probably what you're looking at depending on you know day trading margin and overnight margin there's a lot of complexities but the point is you can put down a very little amount of money and enjoy the profits or suffer the losses of a very very large amount of assets you'll probably read multiple times that most futures traders lose money um, in fact, you're probably going to hear that it, 80 percent of people lose money, and I would vouch for that. I would say that is probably true. Um, but what you don't hear is, you know, people just say, "Well, you should never trade futures because everybody loses," and and that's not necessarily true. What you don't know is most people lose because of not the markets themselves, but the way that they approach the markets. Muted. Unmuted. Hey, hey, Carly, I got a question yep. for you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> who would you say loses more, well, more times, uh, not necessarily more money? The guy who's on margin or the guy who's not on margin? I would say that somebody that's chronic margin call, um, you know, always pushing the limits, 
probably has a very, very good chance of losing money. The guy that trades conservatively, always has excess margin, is going to, in general, do much, much better in these markets. Well, I, the reason why I ask you that is this is because, you know, as you, you know, as you know, I trade options and options are, are obviously all cash. You, you, I mean, you can have a margin account, but, you know, I mean, I, I, I constantly preach that, you know, it's not a, it's not a good idea to, to trade it in a margin account, always trade in a cash account. And, you know, options, of course, you know, have some, have some risk there, you know, with time and, and, and volatility and decay. Um, yet, you know, so, I mean, I'm not necessarily taking the most conservative positions yet. I'm not, I'm not on margin. Um, but I, I was just curious as, as far as futures traders go, um, are they, you know, do, do you find that, that, you know, there's a, I know you're in Las Vegas and I hate to use this analogy here, but you know, there, it, it is, it is true at times. There's a gambling mentality there of the guy who wants to use leverage and, and, and continues to lose and lose, lose over and over again. Um, but you know, do you find that that you know that the people who at least control themselves in terms of risk management do much better than the other guy? Um, people that that fail to to use risk management. I'm sorry, you're, you're people that put, push the limits tend to um, basically push the odds of success completely out of reach. <laughs> put it that right. way. So somebody that's that's coming to the market, like someone that comes to the co commodity markets with a realistic expectation of, you know, there's definitely money to be made here, but there's definitely, you know, money to be lost. The first, like the biggest red flag I get is a lot of traders will, you know, when they're first learning, um, they're deciding, you know, how the point values per commodity, because it's not like stocks where everything's convenient and everything's quoted the same in commodities, uh, like grains are 50 cents a penny, uh, oils, ten dollars a penny, and so it get, takes a little while to get used to those types of things. So the first thing beginning traders tell me is, "So Carly, if I buy here and I sell here, how much am I going to make?" But no one will ever say, "Hey Carly, what happens if I buy and it goes and it goes down? How much am I going to lose?" No one ever says that. They only think one way, and they only think in, in terms of profits, which you know it's good to be optimistic, but it's important that that everybody understands if you get into the market, there's you know it can it can obviously go against you, and you have to be prepared for that and, and adjust accordingly. I found um, the traders that, that find a way to make money in these markets are, you know, the people that um, not necessarily fully fund an account, but let's say, for example, um, the margin on, like, let's say an E-mini S&P is about 5000 and the value of the contract is, I don't know, just off the top of my head, somewhere around $70,000. Well, you could theoretically be I don't want to say control because it's not the right word, but you can theoretically make or lose money based on seventy thousand dollars worth worth of the S and P with only five thousand in your account. That is way too much leverage for most people to to successfully trade on. But um, really, you you don't just because the market gives you the leverage doesn't mean you have to use it. You could put twenty thousand in an account, thirty thousand, and right away you're cutting the leverage in half. And some people would say that's a disadvantage, but in all honesty, um, it gives you a lot more room for error. It's going to cut down on some of the emotional, you know, heartache in trading a small account and those types of things. So I think people that um, use less margin, I'm not saying, you know, obviously, in a commodity account, it's different than stocks also, I should point out. In stocks, you have to apply for a margin account and you have to have a certain amount in your certain balance and things like that. In commodities, everybody gets margin. It's free. They don't charge you for it. Um, they don't have a limit. Like you can open with a couple grand if you want to and, and get margin. And um, so because it's so readily available, people tend to just assume that they have to use it. If they're given that much leverage, they, they have to use it. But that's not true. Perfect. Thank you, Carly. <clears throat> yeah, no problem. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so anyway, it's not necessarily the commodity markets, I believe, that, that cause people to lose money. It's maybe the way that they approach them. And a lot of people, not only do they abuse leverage, but they tend to overtrade. Um, overtrading is, is human nature. I mean, trading is exciting. It's fun, especially if you have a couple of winners, then it's, it's almost like an addicting type of uh, situation. A lot of times people will fail to take profits, Bob mentioned that just a little a little earlier. You know, if the money's there, take it. You can't go wrong taking a profit. You might leave money on the table, but who cares? A profit's a profit. Um, even worse, it's sometimes uh, 
you know, traders fail to cut losers, and this is hard to do because when you cut a loser, not only are you locking in a loss, it's guaranteeing that you lost money on that trade, but it's also an emotional loss as well, and that's hard to stomach sometimes. It's very easy to grow overconfident in good times. When you're talking about as much leverage as you see in the commodity markets, and you happen to catch a ride, or you you know you have a good run, it's very easy to get into that complacent state of mind and forget about the risks that you're taking to, to make those sorts of returns. And when you become complacent, that's exactly when the markets teach you a lesson, to be honest. Um, then there's there's the type of trader that'll, um, you know, if you have a bad run and they start trading scared and scared traders tend to, you know, they're slow to pull the trigger, they're overanalyzing, and in all honesty, they're they're really probably not in a, in, in a position to be trading. If you find that you've had a little bit of a, a bad run, you're better off shutting the computer off, taking a week off, a month, or, you know, maybe even three months if that's what it takes, and just clear your mind. There's no reason, you know, trading's an emotional game, and it's it's really, it comes down to mental stability. If you If you don't have your mind, and your wits about you, then uh, you're going to have a tough time. The fun thing to talk about when we talk about commodities is life-changing wins are possible. Are they common? No, but it can happen. I mean, I've seen some really incredible things. Uh, you'd you would you'd be shocked. But one particular example is I've I've seen a trader uh, during the 2008 financial collapse. He took a $10,000 account and he loaded it up with put options in the E-mini S&P and I'll, I have to admit, when this trader told me what he was doing, I thought maybe he was a little crazy. I I tend to personally not be a huge, huge fan of, of buying options into volatility. He was, you know, he started buying these puts after the market had already started dropping. Um, it wasn't necessarily a high probability trade, but it didn't matter. He he was in the right place at the right time. And so this gentleman uh, turned a $10,000 account into about half a million, and he did it in two or three weeks. I mean, it was a very, very short period of time. Um, so those types of things, it can happen. And I, I can't think of many markets in the world, other than commodities or futures and options on futures, that something like that's possible. But the, the downside of the story is, rather than, than taking the the profits and living a happy, wonderful life, um, he ended up giving them back. And so that just gives you just an extreme example of how volatile and how leveraged these markets can be. Hey, Carly, can I, uh, can I uh, just share a quick story with everyone? Sure, of course. <clears throat> my dad, my dad was a broker for, for many years back in the, in the sixties and mid seventies. And, uh, well before, well before you were born, and even before I was born. And, um, he he always he always tells me the story because uh, about a guy who uh, was uh, trading in the uh, in pork bellies, and I guess what happened I guess it was some short shortage or something like that. It might have been pork bellies or might have been beans. I, I believe it was pork bellies. Anyway, the thing is is that um, they went they were he he was long pork bellies and it went lock limit up seven consecutive days. And I think he took like a thirty thousand dollar account up to like a million dollars. You know we're talking like forty. Over 40 years ago, maybe 45 years ago. So, so it was, you know, I'm sure you've seen, you know, that, you know, this is a great example where you showed me from 10,000 to 500,000. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, in just literally seven seven days. I mean, can you imagine every single day you you come in and your account is going up like that, and you you, you don't even you can't even do anything because it's you know lock limit up right right from the right from the right from the get go, you know. <laughs> It's like you know you you, you, you got to figure out what to do to, to to protect yourself, but you can't even do that, you know. So anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you guys. All right, um, another example that uh, I just wanted to mention was this is a long time ago. I mean, I realize 2006 is like an eternity when you're talking about the markets, but um, there's this, a good story. This is back in the days, this is like when things were going from electronic to open outcry, so everything was kind of, you know, in transition mode, but most of the most of the volume was still traded in open outcry pits. And when I say open outcry, I'm talking about the guys waving their hands in the pits and yelling and screaming. Um, but anyway, this is, I think the spring of 2006, there was a, a metals collapse. We're talking, see, in today's terms, it might not be so dramatic because with what we've seen in gold the last couple of years, 
you know, it, this may not seem that that bad, but uh, gold was down about a hundred dollars in in one trading session. Silver was down, I want to say two or three, which last year happened all the time. But in 2006, this is something that any, nobody had ever seen before. And uh, anyway, to make a long story short, I I personally knew one particular trader that had taken a, an account of. Uh, I think he ended up he started with two or three hundred thousand. He brought it all the way up to six million dollars. And then in one day, his account went from six million dollars to negative three million. So he basically lost nine million dollars in one day on that metals collapse because he was long futures, he was short puts. I mean, I'm not obviously he was definitely over leveraged and and he had just had too much risk on the table. It worked for him on the way up, but on the way down, when everything came crashing down, it was a complete nightmare. And some of you that aren't familiar with futures might be wondering how in the heck, if he has six thousand six million in his account, how he could lose nine million. Well, the answer to that is in in commodities, you can lose more than you have on deposit. Now, trust me, your brokerage firm never wants you to lose more than you have on deposit. Most of the time, they're going to blow you out, which means they're going to liquidate your account if you get down to somewhere near zero to prevent that from happening. But again, this is back in the open outcry days. Things weren't quite as transparent. You know, a broker couldn't or a brokerage firm couldn't pull up a client's account and necessarily see everything in real time because orders were on paper tickets and it, it just wasn't as, as organized as it was now. But anyway, those are some good stories. All right, I'm going to just go over a few things, uh, basics of futures trading. Some of this is really basic. Hopefully, I'm not boring you, but hopefully, uh, it'll just give you a little better idea of what, like a lot of you probably watch business news TV, and you hear a lot of these terms, and you might not really fully understand what they're talking about, so hopefully, we can clarify that for you. There's really two commodity markets. There's a cash market, which I call the now market, and there's a futures market, which I call the later market. And really all that is, is, um, you know, farmers, uh, producers, end users that are trading corn, soybeans, wheat in the, in the actual market when they're physically exchanging money for commodity, that's the cash market. The futures market, which is what we're talking about, it's based, you know, it's used for hedging. A lot of farmers will use it to hedge their price risk, but most of the market volume is, is speculation. People like you and me or you know anybody that's basically trying to place a bet on the markets on a on the price movement and uh, and going with it from there uh, there's one thing to point out here and I'm going to do this over the next couple slides but I'll mention it now almost always the cash market price is going to be lower than the futures market price and the difference is what's called the cost to carry or storage cost. I mean, you can imagine, uh, just think about the definition, what a futures contract is. A futures contract is the the obligation to make or take delivery of the underlying commodity at a future date. So that future date might be, let's just say it's December for December corn. So between now and December, whoever's actually holding the physical corn, they have to store it, they have to insure it, uh, they have to you know, do anything that, that might be necessary to maintain it, and that all costs money. So if you hear somebody on TV talking about the cost to carry, this is exactly what you're hearing, or what you more likely would hear is somebody talking about contango. They, they throw this word around a lot, but most people don't really understand what contango is, and they make it sound like contango is something out of the ordinary, but it's not. Contango is actually ordinary. Contango is what normally happens in, in most market situations. And contango is exactly what I just mentioned on the previous slide. Contango is if the cash price of a commodity is cheaper than the futures price. The only time that you will see backwardization, which is the opposite of contango, backwardization is, is something that doesn't happen often, but it can happen if there's a shortage in the cash market. And what happens is, you know, most commodities, not all commodities, but most commodities are renewable. You can plant a crop this year, it comes out of the ground next year. So just because there's a shortage this year doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be the a shortage to the same magnitude next year, although there probably will be. But in extreme cases, if there's a shortage in the current crop, you might see cash market price go above the futures market price.
Hey, Carly, I had a question for you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> does um, does contango necessarily mean uh, equate to bullish, and does backwardation necessarily mean uh, bearish? I would say, I would I would imagine in the cash market, a backwardation is bullish, and then uh, in in the contango market, it's in, t in a t contango situation, it's probably probably bearish for the cash price. But that but I could be wrong. What do you, what do you uh, what do you think um, about that? I think in general, I would my personality is is very similar to yours, and that I would be looking to you know buy the cheap and sell the expensive. So I would I would have to agree. Um, I'm not sure it's quite that simple, but in general, yes, I think you're you're probably uh, accurate. The the reason why reason why I ask about that because oftentimes in those webinars, what I'll, what what we talk about is um, the VIX um, term structure. And the the futures curve with with the VIX and and <clears throat> you know uh, currently right now if you look if you look at the at the term structure of the VIX volatility futures, it's in a, it's in an extreme contango situation. It has been for a while, and it's a very very steep curve. So how l let me just ask you how would you how would you interpret that very very steep curve when you if you look at the VIX futures all the way out to say. January, February, March of next year. Um, mm -hmm. Like the VIX is, is like 15 now. You can go to January, February. The VIX futures are like 24. You know, so it's it's a huge premium on the futures. How would you how right. would you interpret that? That's interesting. To be 100% honest, I've never um, I did. I, I look at the VIX a lot, but I never really took the time to go out and look at the back months and notice that they were trading at such a difference. And I'm I'm not quite sure what the what the explanation would be. Um, I don't know. I don't have a, a simple answer for you. I'm sorry, but it's I, 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 no, I, um, no. But it's, but it's interesting. You know, at least you, you know, what you, what is, it was good that you you, you brought out the contango because it's interesting because mm -hmm. that sort of situation, you know, is <clears throat> like for instance with the VIX, it's really skewed by a lot of these um, ETFs, the UVXY mm -hmm. and, the, and some the VXX, some of these things that are that are out there that that force people to buy futures and um, that pushes the price up on those things. So I'm just wondering if there's, you know, situations in commodities, like you know, and that sort of stuff that you know forces people to buy, or is it much more of a of a pure um, of, of a pure market? Well, in the case of uh, something like the VIX, like you're really only dealing with with mostly speculators. It's not a true um, a true market. Whereas if you're talking about corn or soybeans, there really are farmers growing it, and there really are uh, you know, mills buying it and processing it. So I think it's maybe a little bit different, less speculative and more actual supply and demand. But uh, uh, no matter, all market has speculation in it, no matter what happens. So I would say maybe it's a little more pure in the commodity market, but, um, you know, I guess it's it's an opinion. <laughs> it's hard to mm. say that that's a fact. Um, but it, it's definitely an, an interesting an interesting kind of a situation. You'll notice like in the financial futures, like if you look at uh, treasuries or, you know, well, mostly interest rates, treasuries or like maybe the euro dollar or something like that, you'll notice that almost always the back months will be will be at higher prices um, and they tend to move faster and, and all of these types of things. And I think, um, you know, that's also more speculation than than true uh, you know, pure market pricing, things like that, like you would see in the commodity markets. In the commodity right. markets, there's at least some sort of mathematical formula. Whether it's accurate or not, I don't know. But you can say, okay, it costs X number of dollars to insure the crop, but it costs X number of dollars to uh, to water it or to store it or whatever it is. And so there is some sort of relationship that ties it together. Fantastic. Thanks, Carly. And this is just a really quick, uh, cheesy maybe even, chart of uh, what a, a normal market would look like, a normal carry charge or a contango market. And uh, the months that you see here, December, March, July, those are just representing delivery months. So obviously December of 08 is going to be cheaper than March of 09 and so on and so forth. So this is exactly what we just talked about, but it's a picture instead of words. And here it is again, backwardization, which is not normal. The front month is more expensive than the back months. You don't see that very often. Now you might be wondering what the heck keeps these all these prices together? Like what?
keeps the cash price and the futures price moving in the same direction because they're really two different markets. And there's one thing to, to mention about the cash market as well. It's not as simple as what I have up here. I mean, I say cash market like, like it's something simple and it's not. There's actually, I mean, ca the cash market is just um, kind of describes, you know, the spot market, but it's not just one big marketplace like the futures is. And futures, all all futures are traded through uh, either, you know, the CBOT or any particular exchange. There's only a couple of futures exchanges in the country. So all futures go through the same hub. But in the cash market, you're talking about, you know, two farmers in Iowa um, putting a deal together or a co-op in, in Kansas putting a deal together. So there's many markets and each different market, like each locale has different pricing. So it's a little more complicated than what I'm putting up here, but um, you know, we'll keep it simple. So anyway, arbitrage is the glue that holds the futures markets together. Without arbitrage, there would be no incentive for prices in the cash market and the futures market to remain correlated let alone account for cost to carry. And what you have to keep in mind is the futures contract, as we mentioned before, it's an agreement to make or take delivery of the underlying commodity at a certain point in the future. Well, what that means is at some point, eventually, if we're talking about December corn, it's gonna, you know, let's just call it December. In December, that futures contract is gonna have to match the cash market price. Otherwise, you know, what good are these markets if, they, if they're not correlated? And the reason, that it does match the cash market price, or at least, um, you know, it's close to it. Like I said, it's a little more complicated than this, but it will be close to the cash market price because the futures contract actually is deliverable. If you went long corn and you held it all the way to expiration and you, you ignored all your brokers please to offset, in theory, you could actually take delivery of the corn. And that's why these two, the cash market and the futures market are tied together and their prices move together. It's not easy to do, but um, the idea of arbitraging the both mar both markets would be if you think that the cash market is expensive relative to the futures market based on the, your what you deem to be the cost to carry, you know you could buy the cheap and sell the expensive. Obviously, that's um, it's not easy for someone like us to do, but maybe somebody that's a farmer that actually has the commodity in hand, uh, that would be a real option. Anytime you mention commodity trading to people that have never traded commodities before, the first thing that comes to their mind is, well, I don't want 5,000 bushels of corn delivered to my house, and you hear that all the time, but trust me, unless you really, really want corn delivered to your house, and it's not going to happen. And in fact, even if you want corn delivered to you, it's not going to come to your house. It goes to a warehouse, and it's up to you to go pick it up and figure out what to do with it. But Anyone that has a telephone or email or pays any sort of attention whatsoever will never be delivered upon unless they really want to. There's two things um, that precursor the delivery process, one being the first notice day, and it occurs prior to the expiration of the corresponding futures contract. As a trader, you really don't want to be in a market beyond first notice day. In fact, you don't want to be in the market on first notice day. You want to get out at least the day before, but more probably more realistically, you want to get out a couple days to a week before because you don't want to be with the herd switching over, right? You want to you know, do your own thing. You don't want to follow the sheep. But if you do happen to hold a contract beyond first notice day, anybody that's long, if you're long beyond first notice day, the exchange can come to you and say, okay, we're assigning you delivery notice. And um, it's up to you to basically what, what's called retender it. If you don't want to, re if you receive a delivery notice because you held your contract too long and you just for whatever reason didn't get out in time, you can blame yourself or you can blame your broker or whoever you want to blame. But the bottom line is it's your responsibility. You should have you should have gotten out. But a good broker would have warned you. Anyway, with that said, if it does happen to you, don't panic. You really just have to tell your broker to retender it, and what that means is the brokerage firm will actually um, sell your obligation in the open market. And you know what? It's going to cost you a little bit of money, depending on the situation in the market. It could be anywhere from 
200 to 500 dollars so it's not going to be a fun experience but it's not going to be as horrifying as receiving 5,000 bushels of corn the last trading day is comes after the first notice day and that's basically when the contract expires remember these aren't stocks stocks go on forever and ever unless the exchange delists them or you know the company goes bankrupt or whatever the case is and commodities they expire in fact um, a lot of commodities like for example crude oil expires every month so there's actually 12 different crude oil futures contracts every year And actually, I, I kind of went over this on the on the other slide. If you receive a delivery notice, don't panic. It's going to cost you a little bit of money. It's going to be an, an inconvenience, but it's not going to be the end of the world. The greatest thing about commodities is you can buy or sell in any order. I guess you can do that with stocks too, and that's great. But with commodities, you can do it without borrowing shares, without paying interest, without qualifying for a margin account. It just is what it is. And the reason that this is possible is futures contracts are not, or I'm sorry, they're not, uh, they're not assets, they're liabilities. You're trading basically an agreement, not an asset. Other than margin, there's really no restrictions against short selling in the, in the commodity markets. Now, you know, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not here to argue. It, it just is what it is. But you could, again, you can buy or sell as much as you want. And y'all probably really uh, understand this, but it, just to confirm, um, in commodities, when you go long, you're buying a contract. Obviously, if you're buying or you're going long, you, you're hoping that the market goes higher so that you can sell it to offset your obligation at a higher price. And the same thing with going short. If you think if you think crude oil is going lower, no need to borrow shares, no need to pay interest. You just go ahead and sell a futures contract, and if you're right, you can buy it back at a lower price, and this is called offsetting your trade. You're probably also going to hear people talk about being flat the market. Being flat the market means that you don't have any positions on. So if you buy one contract and you sell one contract, you're flat the market because those two the buy and the sell offset each other. They cancel each other out, so you're done. All right, choosing a platform and a broker is very important. And most people, they spend all their time looking at charts and reading fundamentals and doing all those sorts of things. And those are very important, obviously. I mean, you're never going to make money if you don't pick the right direction or the right strategy or have the right mindset. So all of those things are important. But you probably want to spend almost as much time determining which service level you're going to use, which platform you're going to use, because I'll tell you what, it really, really makes a difference. I mean, I know I'm a broker and I'm biased, so please keep that in mind, but it's very important to make sure that for your skill level and for your experience, um, for your knowledge and, and for your personality, you're working with the right firm, the right person if you're working with a broker, and you have the right platform. Trust me, if you if you try to push it, if you're somebody that's new to commodities and you think you're you know you want to trade online without a broker, you're going to have a really hard time. I mean, it's it's something as simple as using the wrong symbol. Um, like for example, if you're going to trade gold, there's a full size gold, there's a mini gold, there's an e micro gold, and that's just those three contracts are traded on uh, what's now COMEX division of the CME group but there's also a mini gold and a full size gold traded on a completely different exchange the NYSE um, also lists those products so you're talking about different margin requirements different liquidities different I mean it's it really gets to be over overwhelming and so if you don't know things like that you might accidentally be buying a full size gold when you meant to be buying a mini or you might be trading gold on, the, on an exchange other than the one you thought you were on, which requires more margin or less margin. I mean, so it can be really a big headache. So if you don't know those types of things, you're really, really, it's probably a good idea to work with a broker in the beginning. And then once you get more familiar with things, you can work yourself down into an online trader. Um, 
but here's just kind of a, a basic overview. Uh, most commodity firms are going to offer full service, broker assisted, or self directed online. And there's also now a new category in the last couple of years discount online. I would say most traders uh, that are experienced and, and know what they're doing would be fine with a self directed online account. But you want to make sure, you know, if you are trading online, that you have, you're with a firm or with a broker that you can actually pick up the phone and get someone that knows what they're talking about to answer your questions or to fix your problems. Because trust me, if you're, if you don't, you're you're in big trouble. You might get away with it for a couple months or maybe even a year, but if something goes wrong, we're talking, you know, who knows, maybe the flash crash or maybe just your computer goes down and you need someone to help you get out of your trades. If you're with the wrong brokerage firm, it can end up end up costing you a lot of money. I've seen um you know, I've seen people go for the discount online firms because they cha they save a quarter or a dollar in commission, but in the long run, it can, you know, it ended up costing them a lot of money. Not everybody, but in certain situations, I mean, I've talked to people that have lost, you know, thousands of dollars because they didn't have access to open outcry because they were trading futures with a stock firm or, you know, there's, there's all kinds of possibilities, but trust me, cheapest isn't always the best. And on the other spectrum, the most expensive isn't always the best. Just because someone's charging you a million dollars for commission doesn't mean that they know exactly where the market's going tomorrow, even though they might tell you that. So you really have to just use your head, know exactly what you need and what you want, and get somewhere where you're comfortable and you know you can get good service. Now keep in mind, most a lot of traders nowadays obviously do prefer to trade online through a platform, and that's perfectly fine. Um, as you know, as long as you're comfortable, you know the order types, you know the commodity symbols, all those types of things. But you have to understand, you when you do that, you are accepting the risk of misplaced trades, and it and it also promotes the tendency to overtrade. I I have clients that trade with me on a full service basis. Um, not because they don't know what they're doing, they've been doing this for years, but because they know if they sit in front of a computer and they have flashing lights and platform access, they're going to they're gonna trade too much and it's probably not going to be in their favor. You know, usually people that trade too much, like they trade out of boredom, usually works against the overall goal of making money. Most brokerage firms um, will offer several platform choices. Most firms will offer a free platform. It may not, you know, and most most of the time that's going to fit the needs of most traders. Um, however, if you're doing something that in, that requires an intense platform, if you're scalping or something like that, you know, it's it might be worth paying a little extra for a, an upgraded platform. So do your research, and you know, if you're working with a good brokerage firm or broker, they'll be able to point you in the right direction because it can be overwhelming. I mean, some firms. I mean, in particular, we have access to probably around 30 trading platforms. And so for somebody that um, doesn't know exactly what they're looking for, or what, what they're doing, it can be very overwhelming. So hopefully a broker would be able to help you narrow things down and give you some good, good choices. If you're a high volume trader, you're going to want to stay away from something that has a... Um, a per trade fee, like a lot of platforms out there will charge you an extra buck a trade or an extra, you know, an extra 50 cents a trade or whatever it is. And that's great for a smaller trader. But if you're somebody that's, that's doing several contracts at a time and you do a lot of volume, you end up paying a ton of money for a platform. It just doesn't make sense. So if you're doing a lot of volume, look for something with a, a fixed monthly fee. And keep in mind, this is one mistake that a lot of uh, people looking to get into commodities make is don't forget that each platform is backed by a brokerage firm. You're trading with a brokerage firm, not a platform. So you be familiar with the margin policy. There's some brokerage firms out there that will uh, give you discounted day trading rates. There's some that will that won't. There's some that will flatten your account at the end of the day no matter what. They don't allow clients to hold positions overnight. And there's some that are a lot more lenient. So you really need to know who you're dealing with, not necessarily just the, the computer software. And we kind of mentioned on this before, I, I can't, I mean, whether, you know, regardless of who you pick as your broker, just make sure that you are you do your research. Don't, don't pick the cheapest, don't pick the most expensive, don't pick the easiest. Do your research and make sure you find someone that's going to work for you. Because I'll tell you what, it, it really, really does have a big impact on whether or not you lose money. 
um, whether it's them providing you with market research and trading recommendations or whether it's the, them just being there to pick up the phone at, at midnight when you're, you know, you're having a technical problem um, or, you know, all of the above. Those that are looking to trade commodity options, um, I know, you know, if you're in this room, you've probably done a lot of stock option trading. The commodities are a little bit, a little bit different in, than stocks in that uh, there's two w methods of execution. You can trade them in an open outcry pit, and you can trade them electronically. Most things are going electronic nowadays, but the pits are still there. And in some cases, you can actually get better execution in the pits. So you want to make sure that there's you at least have access to a pit. Don't you know? Uh, if you're going to trade commodities, you want to choose a firm that has pit access just in case you need it. Because every once in a while, something crazy happens. You know, a Fed a Fed meeting, or again, I'll go back to the flash crash just because it's an easy example. When things like that happen and all heck breaks loose. Having access to the pit can really save you a lot, a lot, a lot of money. And I'm not talking 20, 30 bucks. I'm talking thousands of dollars because sometimes if the markets are extremely volatile, the market makers in the electronic markets will pull their bids and asks and you really have no way of trading the options. You're just stuck. But if something like that happens and you have access to the pit, you can always have your broker call the pit and see if they can get you better fills there. And I would say most of the time they probably could. And the, I shouldn't say most of the time. Most of the time in dire situations like that, you're probably better off going to the pits. And this is just kind of off a tangent, but I thought I would throw it in there. Uh, I love this quote. The average man desires to be told specifically which particular stock to buy or sell. He wants to get something for nothing. He does not wish to work. And this is absolutely true. There's definitely a lot of value in services like, um, you know, the newsletters and trading recommendations and all those types of things. But you also have to keep in mind you want to you want to make sure, before you put a trade on you need to agree with it too. You should do your homework as well. You can't just say well so and so is buying this commodity or he's selling this commodity and just go with it and and uh and live with the consequences cuz you're never going to be happy doing it that way. And if you make money it's it's you know it was your trade and if you lose money it was his trade. That's just how how people think. But the reason I bring this up is a lot of people in commodity trading, somewhat in stocks, but I think more so in futures trading, is they're looking for a, an automated system. They want something to just trade automatically with them so they don't have to think, they don't have to make any decisions. Um, in other words, they, many traders are expecting to be able to buy or design a trading system, subscribe to a you know a signal provider, and just put every you know turn on the printing press, but it's not quite that easy. Make sure you do your homework, do your research. It's a tough game. If trading were easy, then um, you know we would, we'd would all quit our jobs and, and do it for a living, obviously. And I thought I would just close things out with the difference between genius and stupidity is finding the balance between risk and reward. Isn't that the truth? So I want to thank, thank everyone for coming out. It was a pleasure being here. I thank Bob for this opportunity. He does a fabulous job.